Muchas gracias Matías, eh, buenas tardes a, a, to a todos. Eh, acá estamos uniendo tres usos horarios diferentes, así que una logística eh, muy pensada para esta clase. Eh, uh, voy a um, cambiar a inglés. Eh, and I will present the moderator um, first place, and it's Federico Leonard. Uh, is experienced um, brand ambassador and sommelier mixologist, wine consultant, and educator with over 20 years of experience in the industry. Uh, as you may know, I started working in the restaurant business with, uh, with Federico, so he was my first teacher. So for me, it's, it's very, very, um, I'm very happy to present him. Uh, he's originally from Argentina. He works in the hospitality business for a decade as a somme and maître, and as well as a wine writer and an educator. Um, and after joining uh, Bernard Ricard's winemaker in uh, 2010, he represented um, the portfolio uh, around the world for 10 years as global wine ambassador. And uh, Federico holds a uh, sommelier diploma from ASI. Uh, he's a certificate sommelier for the Cordon Master Sommeliers and has a level three advanced and uh, the certified educator of uh, WSET. And um, I will present uh, Jim Robertson. Uh, we are very happy to have Jim Robertson uh, with the experience that he has and talking to us about New Zealand is really um, is really very, very important for us. So thank you very much, uh, Jim. Uh, more than 25 years experience in the international alcohol and beverage field. Uh, Jim Robertson is one of the New Zealand's more experienced and respected industry experts. After living in United States for a couple of years, uh, where he worked as general manager and vice president sales with uh, Leon Nathan in North America, Jim returned in New Zealand to work initially as a, as a marketing manager, then international oper operations manager at Montana Wines in 2005, and became global uh, business relations manager for Pernod Ricard. And in 2010, uh, he became the global wine ambassador for New Zealand, so this remit um, was subsequently ex expanded for Australia as well. And in 2012, uh, he became Global Band Ambassador Manager, leading a team of ambassadors based in um, strategic uh, market uh, globally, along with his uh, Australian and New Zealand ambassadorial responsibilities. So in this role, he supports the global market, establish and further develop Pernod Ricard's winemaker portfolios with a focus on Jacobs Creek, um, also St. Hugo, uh, Brancotade and Stone, Stone Lake from Australia and New Zealand respectively. Um, 2019, uh, Jim assumed the role of Regional Education Manager of Asia Pacific, uh, along with, with uh, his uh, Australia and New Zealand ambassador uh, roles and charged with uh, growing uh, the Renault Ricard portfolio within the region with a key focus on uh, the markets like China, uh, India, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Thailand. Uh, Jim, as you will see, is a true supporter of the New Zealand uh, wine industry. Um, Jim has sat on the New Zealand Wine, Grower, wine Growers uh, Global Marketing Committee and was a member of the Food and Wine Tourist Network. Uh, Jim is also an uh, advocate for New Zealand Pinot Noir and was on the board of Pinot Noir. Uh, that is the international event uh, created to showcase the development of this grape in New Zealand. Uh, it was held in uh, 2007, 2010 and 2013. So I will uh, leave um, Federico Leonard and Jim Robertson to start this masterclass and thank you very much. Eh, hola a todos, buenas, buenas tardes, buenas noches. Voy a empezar en, en castellano, me parece lo más lógico, siendo de, de Argentina, ahora pasaré a, a, a inglés para, para moderar esta, esta sesión con, con Jim Robertson. 
Eh, me, me, tengo que empezar a sumar más párrafos en mi, en mi currículum, porque el de, el de Jim ha sido realmente muy extenso, pero eh, para mí es un placer poder hacer esto con, con Jim Robertson, porque eh, primero que es una de las personas que, que conozco que más sabe la industria de Nueva Zelanda, tiene 30 años trabajando eh, eh, allí y conoce prácticamente desde el origen lo que son los vinos neozelandeses eh, en lo que son mercados de exportación y nos contará un poco sobre eso. Y además también es un placer porque yo he trabajado con él hace 10 años que trabajamos juntos y fue durante 6 más o menos mi jefe. Así que eh, he aprendido mucho de él realmente. Eh, eh, en todo lo que es su conocimiento sobre, sobre Nueva Zelanda y sobre el mercado global de exportaciones, realmente sabe muchísimo, así que es un gran placer para mí poder estar junto a él para, para presentar, y bueno, a todos les agradezco la oportunidad, a la Asociación Argentina Someríes, a Paz, a, a, a todos los involucrados en esto, de darnos la oportunidad para que, para que podamos comunicar eh, Nueva Zelanda a, a todos los Someríes que nos están escuchando. Así que voy a pasar en inglés. Jim, sorry, I was uh, giving a, a very good introduction of you. Trust me. Uh, <laughs> and, and saying that, that, um, that we worked together for 10 years. Uh, we've been working together for 10 years and I really learned a lot working uh, beside you that you were my boss for over six years probably. So it's really a pleasure for, for me to To, to join this presentation with you. Uh, you really know a lot about New Zealand wines. You really know a lot about the industry itself. You, you are part of an, that industry. So I think it's going to be a great opportunity for all the sommeliers here tuning in from Argentina and, and other South American countries to learn a little more about New Zealand. So, Jim, your time. Thank you. Rico. Uh, Federico, thank you for that. Um, Taz, Paz, uh, Monica, uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to speak to the association today. Um, when we did our practice run last week, everything worked perfectly, but somehow the little uh, uh, gremlin got into my machine today and it was uh, uh, very difficult. Um, but I'm, I'm pleased I'm here. For one moment, I, I thought it would be quicker for me to get on an aeroplane and fly to Buenos Aires to present in person. So um, the agenda for today is I would like to introduce you to uh, New Zealand, uh, to the New Zealand wine industry, uh, to Marlborough, and then finally to spend some time talking about uh, Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. And um, uh, Paz asked me to include a little bit about um, New Zealand Pinot Noir at the end of the presentation. So hopefully uh, you are comfortable with that sequence and um, I, will, I will get into it and try and make up for a little bit of lost time. You know, we, we share a lot in common uh, with, with uh, Argentina. Uh, we are both uh, winemakers uh, are located in the Southern Hemisphere and um, we used to boast in New Zealand that the vineyards of central Otago were the most southern in the world. Now Federico told me recently that there's some developments in Patagonia that might be a little bit further south than the vineyards of central Otago. So I'm trying to check that out. But as you can see on the map, um, we are in the southern Pacific uh, Ocean and uh, people think that we're very close to Australia. Uh, the reality is that it's a three-hour flight from New Zealand to uh, Sydney in Australia. Uh, and that, in fact, is a, a key factor in how our wines present themselves, in that we're a long, narrow country uh, um, uh, surrounded by ocean, and that maritime influence will be um, a communication thread that, that features right through the, the, the discussion. Our latitudes are similar to Italy. Uh, our climate, uh, very similar to Bordeaux and Burgundy, but, but a little bit cooler. Um, so you will, uh, you will get further insight as we go through the presentation. In terms of New Zealand's position in the world of wine, I think it's really important to note that, that we produce less than 1% of uh, the world's total annual wine production. 
Um, what this does, it, it positions us as a boutique wine producing um, country. Um, it makes our products um, not that readily uh, available. And so we have to focus on a quality story rather than a quantity story. And as we, as we go through the presentation, um, you will get more insights into that, that relative position. Um, just again, to give you some, some, some quick markers, um, we export about 31 million uh, cases, uh, nine liter cases of wine. Um, and this has been growing uh, at a very steady rate of around about 6% for the last 10 years. So it is, it is a slow, gradual growth, um, and we're very excited about the, the way that we've been able to sustain uh, those annual growth rates. Um, those 31 million cases of wine uh, are worth $1.2 billion to the New Zealand economy. We're the, wine is the sixth largest export product out of New Zealand. Uh, and so for us, that's, um, that's pleasing to know that we're a major contributor to the, to the New Zealand economy. Um, one of the key things that we talk about is that we have been very fortunate and very blessed to have created um, one of the most notable new wine styles of the 20th century, and that being Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. And again, I will, I will talk more about that. Um, on, on the right of the screen, you'll see some of our um, uh, happy workers. Um, we're, we're very big on sustainability in New Zealand. And one of the things that we do pretty much as an industry is in the off season and um, leading up to the raison, we're very happy to have sheep in our vineyards. Um, they, they, they graze between the rows. They will do a little bit of leaf plucking for us but we have to move the sheep out of the vineyards when uh, Verazon comes on because they can develop a, uh, a taste for, uh, for ripening grapes. Um, in terms of, of uh, New Zealand, as you can see from the map, uh, it is uh, 1,500 uh, kilometers from north to south, so not unlike Argentina. Uh, nobody in New Zealand lives more than 100 kilometers from the ocean. So it gives you an idea of how, how narrow the country is. And we make wine from the very north of New Zealand, uh, right through to um, the, the very south in, in central Otago. Um, most of the, the, the key wine regions in New Zealand are based along the eastern seaboard. And it's quite interesting, like Argentina with, um, you have the Andes, uh, we have the Southern Alps that run the whole length of the South Island and then continue up th through the North, North Island. And they uh, perform a very valuable service to us in that they prevent the prevailing weather coming from the West, um, um, that they, they catch um, a lot of the rain and a lot of the, the weather. And so along the eastern seaboard, it tends to be warmer and obviously drier. One of the wettest places in the world is here in, in Milford, uh, where we get about uh, 70 feet of rain every year. So it shows you how effective uh, that mountain range is. Um, our highest mountain, Mount Cook, is uh, just over uh, 12,000 feet, or just under 4,000 meters. Um, of, the, of the 10 uh, wine regions that we have throughout the country, um, there are three that, that really account for the bulk of the business. Uh, Marlborough, uh, which is our largest at the very northeastern tip of the South Island, Hawke's Bay, um, midway in the North Island and Gisborne. And these three regions account for just under 92% um, of all the grapes um, harvested in New Zealand. And as you can see, Marlborough is responsible for 75% of, um, of all the annual harvest. So it really is the engine room of the New Zealand industry. 
Hey, Jim, I have a question. Sorry to step in here. Um, yeah, no problem. Just to go back to the, you know, you mentioned that it's only 1% of the global production and yeah. um, and also the history of New Zealand is quite recent, right? It started in the mid 19th century compared to, to other regions. And, and as I understand that the beginning started in the north, right, of the island. So I yeah. want to just to ask you about that and then, if you can, if you can take because I think it's a great map. If you can, like, give us like a one key message of 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 the main uh, regions, for example, Hawkes Bay, Bordeaux Lands, uh, Gisborne, cool. Chardonnay. Yeah. 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 So to yeah. cover like a like a an idea of 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 New Zealand as a whole. Yeah. Very uh, very good question, Federico. Um, the first recorded history of grapes arriving in New Zealand is somewhere between 1821 and 1831. And the original cuttings were brought uh, into New Zealand by um, a Catholic missionaries in order to produce um, um, uh, altar wine. Um, and that recorded was a Bishop Pompelier in 1821. Um, and then Samuel Marsden is recorded as having planted the first actual vineyard in 1831. And this took place uh, in Northland, which was where the, the, the first missionaries um, arrived. So the growing of grapes in New Zealand goes back to the 1830s. The modern New Zealand wine industry really did not start until uh, the late 60s, um, early 70s, when we stopped producing um, wine for fortified products. So prior to about 1976, a lot of the a lot of the grapes grown in New Zealand were things like Richtensteiner, Palomino, um, uh, Thurgau, um, I, I, and a lot of grapes that went into the production of sherry uh, uh, in particular. And it wasn't until sort of the mid uh, 70s that there was this. There were people doing it before, but mid 70s. Uh, New Zealand as an industry uh, embraced the, 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 the noble varieties and we started seeing uh, the, the birth of uh, the, the modern um, New Zealand industry. The early pioneers of, of wine in New Zealand were in fact uh, European immigrants who left um, Europe after the First World War. Um, you know, where you had um, a lot of Germans going to Australia, um, a lot of Italians maybe going to, to California and, and I dare say to Argentina as well. We had a lot of uh, Croatians uh, coming to New Zealand. So uh, even today, uh, you see a lot of, a, a lot of um, Croatian names um, associated with the wine industry. And our founder, um, who founded um, our company in um, uh, 1947, um, his name was Frank Jukic, and um, uh, I'll, I'll talk more um, about him. Uh, in terms of the key regions, um, you know, Gisborne is very much known as, uh, as Federico indicated, our Chardonnay capital. Uh, Chardonnay represents the bulk of the, the, the product produced there. Um, also, um, aromatics. So uh, you'll get um, some Gewürztraminer, you'll get some anise, uh, uh, you'll get some, uh, not so much Riesling, a Pinot Gris mainly. Uh, Hawke's Bay, very much um, our Bordeaux uh, and Rhone um, uh, capital. The, um, the key varieties here are um, Merlot, Cabernet, uh, Syrah in the reds. Uh, and then Chardonnay and, and a little bit of Pinot Gris in terms of the whites. And then Marlborough is the Sauvignon Blanc engine room uh, with a bit of Pinot Noir as well. And I'll, I'll talk more about that. Um, uh, in terms of, of the, the, the physical size of the industry in New Zealand, uh, just on 40,000 hectares. So not, not a big uh, wine producing uh, area at all. Um, and if we look at, at what that um, delivers on an annual basis, uh, the 2020 vintage uh, was 457,000 tons. 
Now, let me put that into perspective. Um, Australia produced uh, 1.8 million tonnes and California, uh, notwithstanding some, some major problems with forest fires and drought, I think was at around about 3 million tonnes. So small and boutique, as I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a question here talking about small and talking about boutique as a, as a country. They're asking what, how, why the, the price, the average price of New Zealand wine is so, uh, so high, the average, you know, if it's, uh, if it's because it has a lot of high production costs, yeah, yeah. because it's a small production, because it's a position, position strategy. That was a question that came through. Yeah, no, no, I, I, again, um, some, some very insightful questions. Um, you have to understand the dynamic of the New Zealand wine industry. Uh, in New Zealand, we have 700 wineries. And those 700 wineries are broken into three categories. Um, we have uh, category three, which is made up of the big companies. And I'm going to use round figures. Um, so we're probably looking now at about three, uh, about 30 category three companies and a category three company produces over 400,000 cases okay so of the 700 there's about 30 okay then you go to category two and category two is 20,000 cases to 400,000 cases and there is about 60 uh, wineries right so, so if my arithmetic is correct, there's 610 wineries that in New Zealand that produce under 20,000 cases. And yeah. a high percentage of them uh, produce uh, under 12,000 cases. So the economies of scale, number one, uh, the high labor costs, number two, um, and the fact that, that we're a very mountainous country with, with scarcity of land for grape growing means that um, uh, our land costs are also very, uh, very high. So when you, when you put those things uh, into perspective, the, the size and scale of the individual wineries, uh, the lack of, of suitable land, um, they're coming more and more scarce. Um, uh, you begin to see that that, um, that we have to focus on um, wines of high value or wines of quality as opposed to wines of commercial value because we just don't have the the the, the acreage or the capacity to to do that. Mm -hmm. Does that does that answer the question? Yeah, I think that was, that was super super clear. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, let's. Let's just begin to, to drill down now into uh, Marlborough as a region. Um, again, uh, as I indicated uh, on the northeastern um, tip of the uh, South Island of New Zealand. Uh, and just while I'm here, an interesting point, uh, we have a population of 5 million people. And if I draw a line across the middle of the North Island, half of New Zealand's population lives north of there and the other half lives down here. And there's less than 1 million people in the South Island, which is also one of the reasons why our, our wines are expensive because um, um, we have to pay reasonably high um, uh, prices for um, uh, labor. But uh, just some key points on, um, on Marlborough. Uh, it, is, uh, it competes with Nelson, which is right next door as to which of these two regions has the most sunshine hours in New Zealand. Uh, rainfall is, is, is reasonably low. And the key point here is that most of the rainfall occurs in our winter time. So we do have to irrigate in New Zealand during the, uh, during the summer, during the growing season. Right? Um, our heat um, uh, degree days, uh, are very much at the, 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 the cool extreme for um, healthy wine growth. And when I talk to you about the, the influence of um, the maritime uh, environment, that also has an influence on um, our very high diurnal day and night temperature variation. 
And again, I'll go into a little bit more uh, later, but that for me is one of the key points that, that make New Zealand wines present the way that they do. And the way I describe it is that um, the, the high diurnal day and night temperature variation gives us um, extended hang time and it allows um, us to develop happy grapes. And by that, I mean that um, they ripen uh, and get um, uh, uh, flavor ripeness or physiological ripeness. They get sugar ripeness, but at the same time, we retain acidity. Whereas in a, in a hotter climate, um, you run the risk of getting sugar ripeness, um, uh, but you lose uh, a little bit of, of flavor and you lose a little bit of acidity. Uh, and then of course, uh, during the winemaking process, you have to make up for that. So that the, the maritime climate, high diurnal day and night temperature variation to me is very, very important component of how our grapes and our wines present themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had another so coming here. We have another question as well, and it's related to something I wanted to to ask, um, because we see it's kind of small region, Marlborough. I mean, compared to New Zealand, it's seventy percent. You know, of also it's quite big, but it's in a region it's quite small. And um, and we had a question coming here. It's like, what's the average price of an of an hectare? You know, because you say land is is scarce. So if you could answer that, Jim. And and my question was that um, I imagine that. Uh, that will depend on water rights, right? If you, yes. if you have water yeah. rights or not, because of course, with that amount of, of inches of rain, uh, irrigation is necessary. And and I will follow up to that question that someone someone asked, uh, asking like, I know that um, it's, it's growing around like a, a thousand hectares or something like that per year. And, but I understand it's like only maybe 5,000 hectares left in Marlboro to be planted. So that's, that was the other question, like how much can Marlboro grow and for how long? That uh, was a tricky question, you're putting a face. You there. know what, I, did I, did I, did I, <laughs> I, love, I love these questions and it sounds like there are a lot of um, uh, Master of Wine students within the, uh, within the sommelier group. So look, uh, they're fantastic questions and um, you know, I, um, I, I'm delighted to, to answer them as best as I can. Um, probably, Federico, the way to answer that is if we look at this map of Marlborough, right? Um, uh, because it, it will help tell, tell the story. Um, so this is the Marlborough uh, region, um, and it, is, it comprises two key valleys. The, the Wairau Valley, which is the top one, and this was the original valley planted. And then from about 2000, um, because land was becoming scarce in the Wairau Valley, we, we opened up the Arwitry Valley. And, and this is, if you like, the sort of uh, more recent development of, of Marlborough. Okay, so that's number one. And, and we, we reckon that Marlborough is probably getting close to about 85% planted, right? And it is going to be difficult to um, continue to find suitable uh, plots of land to grow and develop because to your point Federico um, uh, because we irrigate um, water is is a very precious commodity and what has happened is that there are two main sources of water for the Marlborough region source number one is the Wairau River which um, uh, runs right from the very top of the valley all the way down through and, and into the and into uh, Cloudy Bay. Now, we do not draw water from the river itself. Underneath the river is a big aquifer. And so if you want water, you have to drill down into the aquifer and draw water out of the aquifer, not from the river, but from the aquifer. Now, what is happening is as the region has expanded in terms of vineyards, there is a greater demand for water. And what is happening now is so much water is being drawn out of the aquifer, which is bigger than the river, that there is a concern from the Marlborough District Council that what is happening is that the pressure of, of fresh water flowing to the ocean 
is starting to drop off, which means that salt water is starting to come, or egress come through this way. Mm. And so they now put a cap on the amount of water that can be drawn out of the river. Now, in the Awa Tree Valley, you are, you are allowed to draw water directly out of the river. But in the Awatiri, you're only allowed to draw water out of the river during high flow season. So in other words, winter time and spring when the, when the snow is melting. And so in the Awatiri, you'll see lots and lots of vineyards with a big um, uh, reservoirs because they have to collect the water from the river uh, during winter and high flow and store the water for irrigation over the summer. Now, that then leads to the question of how much is a hectare of land. And so what happens now is that uh, one, it depends on whether it is an existing vineyard or, or bare land. But either way, what you look at is the land and then you look at the water rights that that land holds. And the water rights are split into three categories. A water rights, B water rights, and C water rights. If the land has seawater rights, it means that that is the first water that is cut off if there is a drought or a shortage of water. Then if it's a long drought, they then cut off B water rights. Um, a water rights are very rarely cut off. Now, so give we, us a give us a, a a the A plus uh, price. How much? Uh, two uh, two hundred uh, two hundred thousand plus a hectare. Two hundred thousand plus. Yes, not yeah. not planted, not planted. Uh, planted. Yeah. Oh planted. well, a, a, okay. a combination. Yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah. generally, uh, generally two hundred thousand planted. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then again, of course, it depends whether it's planted in Pinot Noir or Sauvignon Blanc. So there's, there's all those yeah, other course, things yeah. as well. But, yeah, I think uh, all these all adds up to the first question that we got, like, you no, know, about yeah. the high prices, you no, know, all all this thing explains why New Zealand needs to 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 sell premium premium wines, you no, know, and and that cannot do like bulk or, or or entry level wines. Yeah, and and so when you look at uh, when you look at the wines that you have in Argentina, for instance, from New Zealand, uh, you have Cloudy Bay and you have Dog and Dog Point, you know, they're quite expensive wines. Um, then you have, um, you know, the Sinclair Vickers Choice uh, or Sinclair Marlborough Sun, and, and they're probably a little bit more affordable, but still a very high average price. All right. So um, uh, hopefully that answered those uh, those questions. This, the township of Marlborough and the whole region of Marlborough only has 40,000 inhabitants. So again, uh, 20,000 live in, the, live in the, uh, the town of Marlborough. So again, during um, uh, harvest and during pruning seasons, we have to import labor into Marlborough to help us with that, which again is a high cost. All right? So, um, so that's, the, that's the, the, the sort of view. All our prevailing weather comes from the, from the Northwest. And so the Richmond Ranges, helps um, gather the, the, the rain, and I'll talk more about that. And then here we have what we call the Wither Hills, and the Wither Hills separates the, the, the two valleys from each other. Um, just again, to, to, to give you more uh, insights into Marlborough, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on the left-hand side because I'll cover that again shortly. But if you look at Marlborough, um, of the 39,000 hectares in New Zealand, Marlborough represents 20, 000, nearly 28,000 uh, hectares. And you can see how strong uh, Sauvignon Blanc is. Sauvignon Blanc is 22,000 hectares. And Pinot Noir, the number two variety, is 2,600 hectares. And then uh, Pinot Gris, uh, Chardonnay, and then the all others, uh, which is a little bit of Gruner, Arnes, uh, um, Viognier, um, you know, make up 520 and, and hectares. But the, those are the four key varieties. Sauvignon Blanc is, is king, Pinot Noir, uh, Pinot Gris, and Chardonnay. Those are the four great varieties that drive the Marlborough business. I wanted to ask you a question here about the, yeah. the varieties, Jim. Uh, of course, we're going to talk a lot about Sauvignon Blanc uh, and Pinot Noir. 
I know that um, I remember that uh, we tried back thing with you a few years ago uh, some Rieslings from the 90s from Marlboro from Montana which were amazing so really that wines that can age amazingly after 20 20 plus years so we don't see much of that and i don't suppose going to see much of that in argentina but really amazing wines coming from that and um and i wanted to ask you because it's not here i know it's very small but it's something that maybe our colleagues some from argentina are familiar because it's also planted in chile and i want to ask you a little bit about uh, sauvignon gris which i know that we do produce uh, there Yes, we do. Uh, and and um, uh, one of the reasons why we looked at Sauvignon Gris is um, our strength with Sauvignon Blanc is a, is a strategic strength and advantage, but it is also a potential risk because we have 87% uh, of what we export from New Zealand is um, Sauvignon Blanc. And so if the world decides to fall in love with another variety, or if the sommeliers like they did many years ago in North America started to uh, talk about Gruner Wittliner uh, very, very uh, strongly, um, it does put a lot of pressure on us. So we have been looking at what else can we add to our white wine uh, mix or white grape mix, I should say, to help um, uh, give us some, um, some security. And we have been looking at Gruner Wittlina, we have been looking at um, uh, Avorino, we've been looking at Ines. Um, we, as a company, um, got very heavily involved in the development of Sauvignon Gris. The reason why we did that was because the world has fallen in love with the Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc style. But in many countries, and particularly the US, there are, there are pockets where our consumers uh, and our customers feel that the wines are too assertive, the wines are too, uh, too demanding um, uh, of you. And Whereas the, the, the Sauvignon Gris has all the, the aromatics um, and the, 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 if you like, the structure of a Sauvignon Blanc, but is a little bit more generous. It's a little bit more friendly. And so um, we have, um, I think, really the only significant plantings of Sauvignon Gris in New Zealand. Um, we, we, we sell it in New Zealand, we sell it in the UK um and we're doing some work in australia with it right now but um uh that's really um you know uh, we're the only ones that, that i'm aware of that that have a variety labeled um sauvignon gris um okay i think it was yeah. worth to mention because there's some some kind from chile and also to mention another variety that possibly we don't know but it could be something else coming from from New Zealand, from Marlboro, and I think um, the colleague from Argentina might relate that you now when everything is Malbec, 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 uh, and you're not betting to other other variety, it can pose, uh, uh, as I mentioned, some uh, threat or or a problem in the future. So that's just wanted to mention. Okay. Yeah, I enjoyed very much. To me, it's um, you know, to me, it's a great um, it's a, it's a great proposition. Um, now let's just you know again again into some of the history of Marlboro. Um, Marlboro was 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 pioneered in terms of the uh, the modern wine industry by Montana Wines, which was subsequently bought out by Pernod Ricard, um, and that development took place in in 1973. And in 1973, the founder of our company, Frank Jukic, was looking for um, a new region or a new grape growing area within New Zealand where he could produce world-class grapes in order to make world-class wine. And the conventional wisdom was that Marlborough was too cold. That Marlborough was about sheep and cattle. Uh, it was our garlic um, uh, uh, capital. Um, the Marlborough sounds had um, uh, New Zealand um, green lip mussels. Uh, and scallops, 
um, and uh, really um, a lot of uh, pip fruit, a lot of apples and pears. There was not, in 1973, there was not one vine in the ground in Marlborough. And so Frank um, ended up buying uh, about 1,600 hectares um, of land and um, we began planting it. And you can see a couple of historical photos. Uh, in this photo, there's husbands, wives, partners, um, uncles, aunties, cousins of uh, Montana wines that actually helped us do the planting. And you can see here, uh, it, the ground is, is very bare and very barren. Um, and all this was, was, was you know, planted by hand. Um, and if you look at the other photo here, you'll see, because there was no modern irrigation in those days, we actually had the tractors driving through and, and hand irrigating each individual plant um, in order to, um, to grow. So we bought the land in 73 and we planted the first Sauvignon Blanc and the first Pinot Noir vines in Marlborough in 1975. All right. So from 1975 to today, um, Marlborough now, um, has now just under 70% of all the vineyard land in um, New Zealand. And um, of the 340,000 tons of grapes harvested in Marlborough, 86% of it is Sauvignon Blanc, all right? So, you know, that's a really, really powerful um, um, position to be in. Now, uh, I'm just going to um, show you something else. Um, in September 1973, when Frank Jukic was, was interviewed um, by the, uh, the Mendoza Times or the, the, the Marlboro Express, but I, I use Mendoza Times, the editor asked him why he bought all this land in Marlboro. And he stood where this um, statue is, um, and he had sheep running around on his feet. And there was not, there, there were no vineyards, nothing. And when he was asked why he bought the land, his response was, wines from here will become world famous. And this um, uh, statue or monument um, represents the, 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 the place. These vines, the, this block here, was where the first Sauvignon Blanc was planted in Marlborough. Now, let me put it to you another way. Um, you know, Santiago Garfinha, when he, when he first moved to, uh, to Argentina, I think was in the 1870s. Right? And so the grapes have been grown in that area for a long, long time. When you taste a bottle of Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, as a winemaker, the 2019 vintage represents only, what, 40, 40 attempts. Is that right? No, 50 attempts. My arithmetic's terrible. Of us perfecting 40, 40. our... 40, yeah, 40. Yeah, yeah, 79 was the first vintage, right? 79. Correct, yeah. So yeah, 40, yeah. So 40. yeah. Yeah, 40. So we have only had 40 attempts to perfect Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. And I think if you taste some Clary Bay or you taste some Dog Point, I think you'll agree with me that we're doing quite well. Um, and that the world has fallen in love with, with Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc uh, uh, on a global basis. So this is where it all happened and this is where it all started at this very spot at Brancott Vineyard uh, in Marlborough and I'll show you some more uh, a little bit later. And it was very interesting when we launched these products around the world because people didn't quite know how to describe these wines. You know, the wine writers were struggling, the sommelier was struggling. And and if you read Jancis Robertson's books, she says um, drinking Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc was like cat's pee on a gooseberry bush. And if you read Oz Clark, you know, he talks about no, no previous wine has shocked and thrilled and that it was brash and unexpected flavors. 
you know, crunchy green asparagus. And he says that the rest of the world has been attempting to copy this style ever since. And this is all in the space of 40 years. So, you know, I think that is a testament to um, the, 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 the forefathers of, of Marlborough that we've been able to make this impact uh, within 40 vintages. And so I just wanted to throw these two things there just to give you a, a bit of a, a, a read. Now, I'm not going to talk to you about terroir because you know terroir better than I do. But what I wanted to do was just to add another component to it. When we talk terroir, we talk location, aspects, soil, climate, human input, but mainly from a viticultural and winemaking perspective. But here in New Zealand, we have another aspect. And our, it's, it's a Maori word, our indigenous people. And it's called Taronga Waiwai. And what it means is the literal translation is the place where we stand. And so we have adopted this as, a, as, a, as an industry and try to include the spirituality of the connection between the, the, the individual and the, and the land that they are the custodian of. And so one of the things from a philosophical perspective within the New Zealand industry is this understanding that we do not own the land. We just happen to be standing on it at a particular point in time. And our job is to respect it, to nourish it, to treasure it, and to pass it on to the, the next generation um, in a better condition than when we first um, stood on it. So I just wanted to, to throw that, that extra aspect that is a very important part of um, the New Zealand winemaking culture and the winemaking philosophy, which is this, um, this sense of, um, of, of guardianship and this sense of spirituality between between us, uh, the farmer, um, and the, the, um, the generosity of the land to us. And we have to respect that. And by doing so, I think we produce better grapes and better wine as a result of it. So let's, let's really drill down um, to, uh, and, and get into the stuff that you guys really like to, to look at. Um, so what I'm, um, what I'm talking about here is um, the, the pantry, the toolkit that viticulturalists and winemakers have within Marlborough. So the Marlborough region and in the Wairau Valley, this, this big valley here, we actually have two sub valleys. So we have, um, and I'm sorry, the, the word Northern has dropped off there. We have the Northern Wairau Valley and then if we go 10 kilometers, and that's all it is, is 10 kilometers from where the pointer is now to the southern valleys is where the second location is. And then if we drive 25 minutes from Blenheim town through the Taylor's Pass, we come to the Awatry Valley. And these three subregions have very distinct personalities and, and, and we'll, we will we'll talk more about that. And so as a winemaker, I can make wine from a blend of grapes or a blend of wine from the whole area, so a regional blend, or I can do a sub-regional blend from each of these three locations, or I can do a single vineyard from within one of these sub appellations. And that, that tends to be how we as winemakers in Marlborough think about um, what we have to work with. And so what I'll do now is I'll, I'll begin to, to drill down and talk to you specifically about the individual sub appellations and how they influence the aromatics and the, the the flavors and the texture and the structure of, of, of the final wines, right? So, so just try and memorize this um, so that when, I, when we go forward, you, you know when I talk about the Northern Wairau, the Southern Valleys, 
and the Iowa tree, um, you, you'll understand. The other thing I want you to do is to remember this long road here, the very long straight road. And basically that road divides the Wairau Valley in two. And it divides the northern Wairau Valley and the southern Wairau Valley in many different ways. And you'll see what I'm referring to. So, so uh, Jim, we had, um, yeah. there was some question there and there if, if, if the, about the, if, if they have the terrorists identify, and I think we're going to cover that uh, very well because there's a lot of information, deep knowledge on the terrorists. But I don't know if it comes, it comes later, but just one question I think is, is, is worth to mention is like, uh, they were talking about sustainability. What type of sustainable practices are we are, are using in New Zealand and especially as as Plano Ricardo, because I know we have a, a, a lot of investigation and a lot of effort put in the sustainable practices. So if you can mention just a few, a few ones and. Sure. I mean, um, we have a very strong sustainability program in New Zealand. Um, it's, it's called sustainable wine growing. And it, it, it um, has its origins uh, from a Swiss program, which we have taken in New Zealand and, and really expanded and developed it much further. We now have uh, approximately 100% of the wineries and about 97% of the vineyards are now, now members of the sustainability initiative. So what does that mean? Um, in, the, in the vineyard, um, uh, it means, for instance, that we're moving away from uh, um, uh, synthetic or systemic or um, um, artificial sprays and, and now focusing more on, on, on natural um, for both uh, uh, vine health and for um, uh, disease and pest control. Um, we plant a lot of um, wildflowers and cover crops between the rows to attract um, you know, beneficial insects, which then you know, feed on aphids and that sort of stuff. Um, we um, uh, compost all the, um, the mark at the end of vintage, uh, and that is spread back onto um, the, uh, the vineyards in order to, to, to replenish some of the nutrients uh, that have been lost. Uh, where we used to um, just water basically whenever we felt like it. Uh, certainly in our vineyards, um, we have in the ground moisture monitors. So we're able to monitor uh, the, the, the vine health by, by row, by block. Um, and we only water when it is desired and it's all drip irrigation as opposed to, to sort of flood irrigation. Um, we will only water at certain times of the days to minimize evaporation. Um, uh, all our, um, a lot of our um, uh, machinery now harvesters are now all running on, on, on biofuels. Um, uh, in the winery, um, we, uh, there's a lot of carbon dioxide capture. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, heat capture. Um, lighting is a, is a big issue. Um, water recycling within the winery are all very, very uh, important components. When you talk about the actual product itself, um, um, for instance, we've uh, removed a lot of the dividers within, within the shipping cartons uh, to save a huge amount of uh, cardboard. We're using a lot of recycled paper for labeling. Um, we um, uh, obviously screw cap. Um, uh, pretty much. Um, and more importantly, because we got a ship from New Zealand to halfway around the world to our markets, um, the industry is very much um, into lightweight bottles. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Federico, I had a bottle of 2008 um, uh, Santiago Profina the other night and I forgot, <laughs> it. I, I forgot how heavy it was. Yeah, it weighs like uh, no, three kilos. It's crazy. <laughs> I think that's that's something to learn from from New Zealand, really, in in sustainability. I think that was a great question. That's why I, th I thought it was yeah. worth to discuss. It's that you're very very ahead in terms of sustainability as a whole in the industry. Uh, and I think uh, you mentioned that. I think light when you're in the end of the world, like 
New Zealand or Argentina, lightweight bottles, I think, is something which is very important to to do, you know, because you minimize the, the weight of, of, the, of the glass and therefore you're minimizing the carbon footprint of your shipments abroad. Yeah. So I think that makes a lot of sense. And sometimes in Argentina, far as I see, sometimes in, well, even in export market, because I, um, I don't live in Argentina for a long time, but I guess it's so, these bottles are so heavy and really makes no point. And, so, sorry, and the other thing too is um, uh, we also use a lot of recycled glass mm. um, for, 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 you know, um, um, they're crushed and, and then re, you know, um, recycled. So that, that is also a key point for us. Um, the other point that I should make j just to finish off that, that, that sustainability situation is that we, we also um, uh, are audited on a regular basis and they will take away your sustainable accreditation if you don't live up to the, the, um, the requirements of, of the code. Um, if anybody is interested, um, nzwine.com has a very good section on sustainability if you want to, um, to uh, look at a little bit more information on that. So just coming back to recap on this particular slide, three subregions, um, you know, 10 kilometers between the, the northern way around the southern valleys, and then uh, 25 minutes through the Awa Tree, which is um, very, very much coastal. All right. Um, just to make it a little bit easier, um, I, uh, this slide I think you know helps uh, articulate that a little bit more. So uh, the Mulba region, and you can see the the the, the big Wairau Valley here broken into the northern Wairau and the southern valleys, and then the Awatiri, and then the influence of the two rivers, the Awatiri River and the Wairau River. All right, and um, now let's have a look, um, and I'll, I'm going to give you just a little bit of a, a descriptor here. Um, I've added quite a lot of um, uh, copy um, which I don't normally do, but I wanted you guys to have this so that when you get a copy of the presentation, um, this information is available to you on an ongoing basis. Um, um, so if we look at the, if we look at the, um, uh, the, 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 the three areas, um, you know what, uh, I was going to go back, but I won't. We'll look at this one. So when we talk about the Southern Valleys, we're actually talking about uh, four little finger valleys that were left by glaciers retreating back up the valley. So as, as the glaciers went back up into the mountains, they, they gouged out these four little finger valleys. So if you hold your hand out, if you hold your hand out like that, you've got these four... Um, uh, finger Valley. So you've got Omaka, Fairhall, uh, uh, Brancott, uh, Ben Morvan. Well, Ben Morvan and Fairhall are kind of joined together. Omaka, Brancott, um, uh, Ben Morvan, and Waihopai. And so these valleys make up the southern valleys. And what you have there is is, is um, very different soils. So the soils are. Um, are much older, they're heavy clay content. There's a lot of glacial debris rock there. But what they tend to do is, um, is um, because of the clay content, they tend to retain a lot more moisture. Um, and so uh, that helps offset the fact that, that the Southern Valleys are, are a lot um, drier than, than the Northern uh, part of the valley. Um, and, um, uh, again, I'll talk about it, but the southern valleys, which are 10 kilometers away from, from the northern Wairau, are around about two degrees cooler as well. Okay, so, but it, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Then if we look at the, uh, the Wairau Valley, very, very different. The soils um, uh, are relatively young, that they say old here, but they're not as old as the as the southern valleys. I I, I prefer to, to to call them recent gravelly riverbed soils. They're they're very very um, nutrient poor. 
they're very uh, light and almost powdery in the summertime. Um, you get a lot more rain, you get um, twice the amount of rainfall here. I said it's two degrees uh, warmer. Um, and so the Northern Valley ripens about 10 days um, before the Southern Valley does. Um, and, and part of that is, is um, the Tewa there. And, and again, I'll show you some more information on it. Um, yeah, and I think that that's a, sorry, it's a, it's, a, it's a very wide difference for 10 kilometers. A very right. wide difference, and again, I'll, when we go to the next couple of slides, you, you'll, you'll be able to understand just what those differences are. And then the Awatiri, which is uh, our most southern and most coastal, um, this is very distinct. Again, I'll show you some photos, um, but it's much cooler, much drier, very, very windy, very windy, because it's right on the ocean. And so if you look at a 15-year-old vine, from the Awa Tree Valley and a 15-year-old uh, vine from the Wairau Valley, the Awa Tree vine will probably be half the, the trunk thickness because they're, they're stunted by the wind. The, the bunches are smaller, the berries are smaller, um, and as a consequence, obviously the flavors and the textures that come out of that are very, very different. But again, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. So those are the three um, differences. So if you're writing an essay for your uh, sommelier exams, there's some good stuff here for you. Now, so this is the photo of, and, and this one is old because we haven't been able to get the district council to do a new one. But as you can see here, these are some of the vineyard holdings in the, the Wairau Valley. And I ask you to remember the importance of this, this straight um, road here is very important. Now, the yellow represents our company's vineyards and the green represents uh, the, the industry's um, uh, vineyards. Now, there's a lot more green down here now. Uh, this map is about, um, uh, about 10 years old, so they haven't updated it but there's a lot more green in this area here. And this is very, very low lying. This is very low lying land. Um, and there's a lot more green um, up in this area here um, as well. But the reason I wanted to show you this is that we, because we were first in Marlborough, we were able to buy some of the best, um, the viticultural land uh, available to us. And I will go uh, in, into more more detail. But this gives us a very good blending opportunities, but also gives us very good single vineyard opportunities. And it also gives us very good sub appellation. So we can make wine from the southern valleys, which are these, these things in here. We can make wine from the northern Wairau. Uh, we can make wine from the Awateri. Um, but it just shows you the, 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 the spread of, of vineyards that we have. Now, if you look at a rainfall map, okay? Now, this is the main road that runs through here. Again, I, I'm gonna stress this all the time. All these vineyards through here, they get about um, a, a thousand millimeters or 39 inches of rain. But if we go, if we go 10 kilometers down to uh, here, we get just on 600 kilometers. All right, that's in, 10, that's in 10 kilometers. So the rainfall is a significant um, difference between those two um, sub appellations. And it's even lower when you get to the Awateri. The Awateri is about sort of anywhere from three to 500. If you then look at the temperature map, again, there's that main road running through um, the, the, the Wairau Valley. And the northern wire route vineyards are kind of scattered in this area here. And you can see it's much, much warmer. This is the hottest part of Marlborough is, is actually the town of Blenheim. Then if you come to the southern valleys, which are in here, the temperature is two degrees cooler. Right? That's going to make a difference to how you ripen your grapes and the, the flavors and the texture and particularly the acidity. Uh, it's going to make a big difference. Then if you look at the soil map, to me, uh, um, temperature, rainfall 
um, tends to play on the aromatics of the wines. To me, the soil plays to the, to the texture and the structure of the wine. And again, if you look at that, that road that runs through town, and those of you who've been to the Napa Valley, I, I liken this Highway 63 to um, Highway 29 in the Napa. It separates the, the, the two sides of the valley. Now, this map here shows you the soils. And what, what you have here is as the Wairau River over the years flooded, it laid down this bed of river silts and, and gravel or river stones, okay? Whereas on this side of the valley, you have the, the southern valleys, right? So Waihopai, Omaka, Brancott, um, Fair Hall, Ben Morven. And so as the, as the glaciers went back up the valleys, they left behind um, the, the, the glacial debris, they left behind the clay, they left behind really old, old soils. Um, and the, there are lots of stones, but the stones are not round. The stones are jagged, they've been smashed by the, by the for forces of the glacier. So th that soil structure plays a, a very, very um, uh, important role, in my opinion, as to how the wine feels on, uh, on your palate. To give you an indication, and, and if we didn't have COVID, we'd be walking around the vineyards uh, ourselves, but this is what a typical vineyard in the northern Wairau looks like, right? Lots and lots of these river stones or sunstones as we call them. And we don't just put them there to make the vineyards look good. If you dig down uh, two, three meters, this is what the soil looks like, right? So you've got this very light, uh, infertile river silts, and then you've got these the, the, these um, uh, river stones that go all the way through, which is the old riverbed. And because we were one of the first to, to buy land in this particular area, again, we were able to get some of the best soils. And a lot of our vineyards are, are almost called the Golden Mile, right? which is so very important. Now, if we go 10 kilometers, to the southern valleys. That's our Brancott vineyard. And this is the soil structure in that area. So old clay soils, again, some broken rock, um, but the heavier clays um, give you, um, you know, a, a moisture retention. Um, and what we're doing in the southern valleys is um, it, it's where we're planting a lot of our very good Pinot Noir now. But I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. And then if we go to the Awateri, which was the most southern vineyard, again, the Awateri River. And you can see here, we have um, layered uh, windblown loess. Then we've got some of that sort of river stone, again, from the, from the river. And then we've got this really hard, compacted uh, papa, as we call it, or mudstone. And depending how close this is to the surface, we have to do a lot of work to break it up um, in order to um, allow the, um, uh, the, the vines to really search down and, and, and find, find water. So three quite different um, soil structures within those three sub-appellations. And so if we break the, the, the three areas down, the northern side of the valley is warm, two degrees warmer than, than the southern side. We have rainfall, but it's still be defined as moderately dry. The soils are, um, are relatively new soils and, and very infertile with no nutrient holding uh, capacity. And the southern valleys, 10 kilometers, two degrees cooler, much, much drier, very old soils um, with heavy clay content and sort of semi-fertile. Uh, and then if you go to the Awa tree, very, very cool, very dry. And again, that sort of combination of, 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 of recent um, soils, um, semi-fertile. And then we as a company are able to then um, 
produce different wine styles that are matched to different brands in those in those particular areas right and so for us that, that's that's quite important to be able to do this 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 mixing and and matching right and so if we were to look at Sauvignon Blanc now specifically, what do those sub appellations do or what effect do they have on the wines, on the aromatics of the wines, on the, on the, 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 the texture, the structure, the body of the wines um, and how those wines present themselves. And over the years, you know, we, as a company, we, we're very big into research. We're very big in trying to understand uh, and quantify um, what we get. And so if we look at the northern side of the valley, which is uh, the, the, the green arrow, what you'll tend to see is a lot of tropicality, tropical notes coming through, right? Aromatically, you, you're, you know, you're looking at, um, you're looking at passion fruit, you're looking at, um, uh, you know, pink grapefruit, you're looking at um, maybe some, you know, some uh, melon or, or some guava sometimes coming through uh, in those notes. You get a little of that sort of herbaceousness, but not a lot of it, right? Um, uh, and, um, it's really more about the, the, the sort of tropical uh, uh, presentation of, of, of the aromas. If you then come and look at the southern valleys, the wines are not as expressive aromatically. They're still expressive, but, but you know, compared to the rest of the world, but within the Marlborough context, they're a little bit toned down in good vintages, yes, you, you do get some of that, um, some of that passion fruit, some of that um, uh, maybe sort of, you know, nectarine kind of note coming through. But what you tend to get out of the Southern Valleys is the herbaceousness. You get that cut grass, uh, you get the capsicum, you get the green olive um, notes coming through, uh, you know, from, a, from an aromatic perspective. You get the sort of this oiliness, uh, this, this weight coming through. And then if we go 25 minutes to the Iowa Terry, that is, that is really, really different. And what you get there is this, you know, when you go and you buy um, uh, 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 vine ripened tomatoes and you break the tomato off the stalk, you get that lovely tomato leaf, tomato stalk pungency. You also get a lot of black currant. Uh, you get a kind of a nickly character coming through. And for me, from a personal perspective, when I, when I know these wines, I get this lovely sort of um, salty um, minerality as well, not only on the nose, but obviously very specifically on the, on the palate. And I think a lot of that is because these vineyards are right on the coast. You can stand there and you can actually hear the waves breaking at our triple bank vineyard. It's that we're, we're, we're on the coast. So we yeah, have tried... It's a, no, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic way to, to, to explain very graphic the differences between each one of the, of the sub-regions. I think, I think it's great. Normally when you think about Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand, from Marlboro, you know, the first thing that would come, anyone would describe say is passion fruit. It's a very, very tropical, you know, lime, passion fruit, et cetera. Uh, but I think it's, it's great to see here the differences with, within the, the regions from normally the tropical would come from the Northern mm -hmm. Wairau Valley and then the textural in the Southern Valleys. And I know it's kind of rare to, to uh, for in Argentina probably don't have any um, Sonia Blanc coming from the Aguateri Valley, but when, if you have the possibility to taste it, it's so different, right? It's, it's, yes. it's so yeah. different than, than the other two. It's like, a, it looks like a, from a different part. Maybe, maybe some similarities to some, something coming from Chile, from, from the coast, maybe kind of like the tomato, but it's, a, it's so, so different. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, if I just, um, oh, what's happening here? Oh, I, I just, so if I just go back to this one, for instance, our Brancot estate wine, you can see is a blend, is a, is a regional blend. And so we get 60% of the blend from the Wairau Valley 
and we get 40% of the blend from the awateri. So the 40% that comes from the awateri is all about acidity and all about structure. Uh, from the southern valleys, we're getting the weight and the body. And from the northern wire out, we're getting the, the tropical aromatics. But then if you look at um, the letter series, this comes exclusively from the Brancod vineyard. Uh, and if you look at um, the Stonely Rapara series, it comes exclusively from the Stonely vineyard. So we're able to, to, um, we're able to get the brands working with th these um, different uh, profiles. So let me just um, move on to there. Now, you know, I'm not a, I, I'm not a winemaker, I'm not a scientist, but when we first launched Solvian Blanc in the, around the world, everybody talked about the methyoxypyrazines, and I'm sure all you guys know it extremely well. You know, that's that sort of capsicum, bell pepper, you know, those, those herbaceous notes, right? And that was what was coming out of the Marlborough in the early days, in the early days. And then as we started to develop the subregions, and we started to understand what the different terroirs gave us, we then started to, to find these other things. And for instance, um, the, uh, the volatile thiols, you know, we talked about the passion fruit coming through, we talked about the grapefruit. So different subregions begin to, to, to show these things. So the methyoxyparazines will come across most of the subregions, but generally the southern valleys. Volatile thiols, to me, you really get the strong presentations when it comes from the northern wire out, uh, the grapefruit, the passion fruit, that's, that's where it comes from. And then the, you know, the, 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 the C6 compounds, you know, that grassy sort of character, um, again, you know, probably mainly from the Awateri and, and from the southern valleys. So we've been spending a lot of time trying to understand the chemistry or the flavor precursors of Sauvignon Blanc. Because if we understand the chemistry, then we can understand how to make wines and deliver wines that we can either dial up or dial down these particular things. One of the issues that we have with volatile thiols is uh, the issue of um, ageability. The, the volatile thiols uh, are quite unstable. So for many, many years, people used to say, oh, you know, we have to drink Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc within three years. Well, no, I mean, Federico and I have tried 10 year old Marlborough Sauvignon Blancs. They just change in, in character and personality. But one of the things we found was that with the volatile files, the MH compounds, Marlborough has those compounds in tens and hundreds of thousands more units Per, per million than the rest of the world. And we've analyzed Chile, you know, California, uh, France, everywhere um, to understand them. And we're able now to reduce the impact of the volatile thiols using viticulture and winemaking techniques to now produce wines that will age for eight to 10 years as a matter of course. And I hope one day that you will be able to try a bottle of our Chosen Rose, um, which you know I, I'm drinking 2010 at the moment. Um, I've got three bottles left in my cellar. So I just wanted to throw this in here for you as well to have a look at. And one of the things that we do, uh, and, and, and we do this for our sommeliers, we do this for our, our customers. Um, again, we have been able to articulate the diversity of the subregions. So if we go back to that northern subregion, I asked you to take a photograph of in your mind. Aromatically, they're very, in, very, very aromatically intense. And they have this lifted tropical fruit, you know, the passion fruit, the, the pink, you know, um, grapefruit. Uh, there is some minerality coming, you know, from, from, the, from, from the vineyard. Um, and when you, uh, when you taste our palate, they're, they're very ripe. They have the same level of acidity as the Southern Valleys, but the acidity presents itself in a softer, rounder way. So generally speaking, acidity is between 6.8 and 7.2.
across the region. But the acidity from, from, the, from the northern wire area or from the wire area tends to be a little bit softer. And in good vintages, you get some of that stone fruit. You know, you get some of the, 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 the nectarine and, and the, um, the, the, the peach coming through, which to me is, is more of a Chardonnay sort of attribute. And then from a textural perspective, the wines are more elegant. They don't have the weight, um, um, but the, the, you know, the, 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 they're fine and, and they have this, this, this elegance to them, All right? this, this elegance to them. Um, from the southern valleys, again, you know, 10 kilometers south, the aromas are much more herbal fo focus. So the bell pepper, the green olive, the lemongrass, that tends to be the, the, the most prevalent character there. You know, flavor wise, again, you know, the herbal notes, the, the little bit of gooseberry, the, 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 the bell pepper coming through, um, uh, and that sort of, that oiliness, that richness, that palate weight, that comes through very, very strongly, uh, you know, when you get to the texture. Fuller body, quite ripe, um, and then really good mid midway. So, you know, the way I describe it is the Waira Valley wines are, 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 are ballerinas. The Southern Valley wines are, you know, the, 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 gym, the, the gym bunny, if you like. Um, and then the Awa Tree Valley, again, very, uh, you know, aromatically, they're, they're very, very assertive. You get that Nestle tomato stem. The acidity is very focused, um, very racy, um, and they're lean. Um, they're, like a, they're like an athlete. They're a runner. Uh, they're, they're focused and they're fine, they're crisp. Um, and my absolute favorite oyster wine. Um, now, what's happening uh, in the future? Um, right now, we, we, you know, there's a lot of work um, happening and going on. Um, we're doing a lot of work with um, whole bunch pressing. Um, that's giving us, you know, a, a really different, um, uh, you know, um, uh, juice to work with. Uh, we, we tend to get, you know, a much finer uh, uh, um, wine that, that comes out uh, as a result of that. Our uh, chosen rose is all whole bunch pressed. Um, while, while fermentation um, is happening more and more, uh, and that's giving the wine a lot, the, the, the Sauvignon Blanc, you know, people say that it's a simple wine. You know, I, I don't believe that. While fermentation is giving us those layers of complexity, uh, both aromatically and also on the palate. Um, there's a lot of barrel fermentation happening, not so much to, to, to give the wine oak characters, but really just to give the wine some extra weight and some extra, um, some extra texture. Um, and you can see in the picture, you see a lot of couve and, and also food, right? Yes. And yeah. like larger format oak. Yeah, so, so Federica, good point for us. If we, if, if we do fermentation, uh, it will be in the food res or it'll be in the couves um, because we don't want that overt um, um, oak character coming through. We just want, you know, extra, extra complexity, extra structure, extra texture uh, and mouthfeel, right? Um, and we would, you know, uh, for us, uh, I don't think we have any Sauvignon Blanc that, that's over 20% in terms of, um, 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 you know, uh, food row or, or couve fermentation. Malolactic with Sauvignon Blanc, um, we don't have any that would be over, say, about uh, 12%. Maybe 20 maximum. Again, the malolactic is just there to, to give you know extra um, extra complexity, um, uh, and then you know obviously lead stirring um, is great. Um, and um, um, we, uh, if again if I look at my uh, our chosen rose, which is our most um, oak influenced wine. Uh, it gets eight months on lees in, in the couves uh, and then gets a year bottle aging. So again, you know, uh, it, just looking to give you more and more, um, more and more texture, more and more um, complexity, more interest. As, some, as sommeliers, what we want to do is to give you opportunities to talk about the personalities 
of the wines. We don't want just to give you, you know, a Budweiser beer, which, you know, is, is the same all the time. We want to give you um, wines within, within the ranges that, that capture different levels of, of um, the viticultural input, winemaking input, um, maturation input. Um, and so, you know, our, our wines are getting more and more interesting. I'm just going back to um, uh, uh, Dog Point. From memory, Dog Point is, is, is an organic proposition. They don't say that it is, but, but it's organic. Um, and, you know, they do um, a little bit of, of, of um, uh, um, uh, barrel fermentation. Uh, if you look at Cloudy Bay, you know, Cloudy Bay, um, they use a little bit of semillon. Um, they, uh, I believe, also have a very small, small component that is oak influenced. Um, the Vicar's Choice and the Marlborough Sun are 100% stainless steel, I know that. Um, uh, so yeah, we're, we're all trying to, to give our wines more personality, give our wines more stories for you um, as sommeliers to, to, to talk about when you're presenting the wines and the food to your, to your customers. So, you know, I, I, I think I've sort of come to a, to a, a logical end um, uh, with, with Sauvignon Blanc. People ask me, just to finish off the Sauvignon Blanc section, people ask me, what is about Marlborough that makes Sauvignon Blanc special? And I could talk for two weeks, but for me, coming back to that spirituality comment that I made about Tewan, to me, Marlborough is the, is the place where the Sauvignon Blanc grape and the land fell in love with each other. Because you need a little chemistry, you need a little love, you need something special other than processes to, to create something magical. So I always like to say that, you know, the answer to your question is why, is, why is it so special? It's because I think the grape and the land fell in love with each other. It's as simple as that. And long may the marriage continue. So now, now what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to answer Paz's uh, question. And I think jump into, yes, jump into red wines. I'm also very conscious of um, timing. So is everybody okay for timing? Yes, we're going to have like another 10 minutes. 10 tops. minutes, okay, five, okay. Five will be better. Yeah, I, I will Paz, do. Paz and I, we need to go to bed. <laughs> yes, it's almost not, midnight here. <laughs> not a problem. Hey, Federico, you don't go to bed before three o'clock, mate. <laughs> I know you. So I know you're getting, you're getting old. Uh, okay, so be very quick. Pinot Noir. There's no country in the world that has this kind of, of um, Pinot Noir influence. Right? In New Zealand, Pinot Noir represents 67% of all the red grapes grown in New Zealand. Right? Um, and the reason for that is we're, we're predominantly a cool climate wine producing country. So if you look at the next largest um, uh, variety, Merlot, 22%, all right? So Pinot Noir, we have 10 wine regions in New Zealand and, and well, I'll cover it off. Pinot Noir grows very well in five of them, all right? Merlot, Syrah, Cabernet, Melbourne, Cabernet Franc, Pinotage, mainly all in the Hawke's Bay, right? But Pinot Noir, five regions within New Zealand. It's, it's only 7.7% um, of, of, of the total harvest. 20% of that we use for our method uh, um, a traditional, um, which is very important to us. This is a, this is a growing uh, category for us. Important thing. All you guys, when you, when you get your textbooks, when you're online, when you're, you're, you're studying for your, for your exams, everybody talks about Central Otago Pinot Noir. Very few people realize that 58% of all the Pinot Noir grown in New Zealand comes from Marlborough. Comes from Marlborough. Um, 
because central Otago gets is, is kind of the, the, the you know the, the sort of high profile uh, region right now. Now in central Otago, it represents 76% of the production, but only 20% of the of the total crop. All right. So so central Otago is to Pinot Noir what Marlborough is to Sauvignon Blanc. Okay. So that's that's how I that's how I describe that. <clears throat> Now again, I've given you, um, uh, I've given you more information that I, I won't go into uh, in, in terms of the timing, but uh, we listed all the, the 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 key regions. So really, we do not grow good, we do not grow good Pinot Noir anywhere north of here, right? So uh, the Y wrapper or Martinborough is is in here and forget about any Pinot Noir North. There's two guys that grow Pinot Noir in Hawke's Bay, but basically um, it is, it is um, the wire wrapper, Nelson, Marlborough, um, what we refer Atherbury. to as, as um, Wipra uh, or North Canterbury, and then obviously um, um, Central Otago. Sorry, one thing I forgot to mention before, really important, all 10, sorry, nine of the 10 great growing regions in New Zealand are maritime climates, okay? Central Otago is a continental climate and you guys know what that is. It's the only continental climate we have in, uh, in, in New Zealand. So Marlborough is, is really all about red fruit. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of raspberry, there's a lot of cranberry, um, red cherries, red plums. That tends to be the fruit spectrum. Um, what we have done in Marlborough is we've moved Pinot Noir off the valley floor and put it up into the up into the southern valleys on the slopes with the heavier clay soils, and we get a, and we're getting much better wines, more structural wines. One of the reasons why Marlborough is becoming very well known for Pinot right now is because of three things. We've had phylloxera in Marlborough, so we have gone and looked for better sites to replant, so gone up into the slopes. Number two, better clonal selection. And number three, vine age. And those are the three things that is making Marlborough uh, Pinot Noir really, really improve. Central Otago originally started in the Gibson Valley um, and then has moved. And the Gibson Valley wines were, were much lighter um, you know, a lot of, you know, um, again, that sort of, you know, red fruit characters, um, good acidity, but they were quite light and elegant. They were, that they were refined. And what's happening now is as the land has run out in the Gibson Valley, more and more people have moved to Bannockburn and Lowburn and Bendigo and some of those warmer areas. So you've heard of Felton Road, you've heard of Mount Difficulty. Um, they are, uh, Akarua, they're three of the uh, top producers that, that come out of Bannockburn, which is considered to be one of the, you know, the, the, the premium regions, all right? Um, and I, again, um, I've summarized the four key regions. There's five and a half thousand hectares, but um, look at Marlborough, look at Central. So there's 75% of all the Pinot Noir in New Zealand comes from Marlborough or Central Otago. But again, I've given you the information here. You can study it. Um, and you can understand um, what comes uh, what comes through. Uh, and I've now made when, sure that when when you travel around normally in export markets, just to mention what you mostly going to find is like coming from Marlboro, right? Uh, Pinot Noir and maybe Central Otago more fine wine side like Felton Road, like or this type that were very well known, but in <clears throat> yeah. more volume is going to come from Marlboro. Yeah, and 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 so. Um, I'll use the price difference between a BMW 3 Series and a BMW 5 Series. So Marlborough, Marlborough will deliver you BMW 3 Series, you know, and with good, excellent quality, but more affordable. Um, uh, Central Otago will be a 5 Series BMW, um, you know, not as, not as much of it around, smaller region, um, and obviously, you know, costs more. Um, and then what I've done here for, for um, give you more information. Um, you know, we've, we've moved out of a lot of the old clones. Um, you know, the, the, the uh, Dijon clones are very, very prevalent. 
um, you'll see probably a lot of the 667 and the, and the 777 clones in some of the better um, uh, uh, wines around. Um, huge amount of canopy management, you know, you know, not just shoot thinning, but also lateral removal um, and cluster and more particularly shoulder thinning as well. Right, um, you know, getting down to one bunch per shoot to, to you know to get the quality that we're looking for. Um, uh, you know, for us, um, to stemming, there's not too many people that that are doing um, um, you know pressing with with um, uh, with the stems. We we tend to do more more destemming here. Uh, a lot of cold soak, uh, pre fermentation, and then uh, obviously post. Uh, for maturation and the key for us is round about I, I don't know of any wine that's over 18 months uh, oak aging generally you know 9 to 15 would be the average um, and almost without a doubt 99% uh, of the Pinot Noir in New Zealand is, is, is in screw caps um, and what that does is, is a uh, consistency uh, but secondly, uh, also helps, in my opinion, with, with, with ageability. The wines take pressure for longer. So uh, Federico said five minutes, so I, I'm going to do that. So, you know, um, in summary, um, a niche producer, high value, expressive, cool climate wines. Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir, because of our climate, are our two hero varieties. And they both have a very different way of presenting themselves to the world of wine because they are so they're so distinctive. Um, and we're very young, you know, Central Otago, Marlborough, both very very young regions. You know, you know, 40, 40 vintages from from a, a wine region is 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 nothing, is nothing. So we're still learning. So before I go, I want to invite you to come to New Zealand the second week of February every year and the second Saturday of every February, we have the Marlborough Food and Wine Festival that takes place in this area here on our Brancot estate. And you will be able to drink Sauvignon Blanc that is made from this area in here, which was the first location in Marlborough to produce Sauvignon Blanc. All right, so put it in your diary and when all this craziness is over, make sure you come and visit and I'll personally look after you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience. And please accept my humble apologies for the um, technical hiccups at the beginning of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I've been I've been with you for ten years. I heard you talking and talking about Marlboro for the, the million times, and I keep learning. So thank you so much for for all this uh, valuable information. I think it was it was it was great to understand um, New Zealand as a whole, as a country, but also the importance of Sauvignon Blanc and the differences between different regions of Sauvignon Blanc in Marlboro. I think that's something that we rarely see. Normally, just think like a one-dimensional thing. New Zealand from from Marlborough, oh, sorry, Sony Blanc from Marlborough, but you can see there's a lot of difference. I think that was that was great. I hope for, hope that you can try some of these wines and at, at any point because I think these uh, these amazing amazing wines coming from here. And Jim, he didn't say, but I love his description of the. New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, and it was always like, correct me if I'm wrong, it's like, wow and yummy. That sh should be a good Sauvignon Blanc from, from Marlboro. Eh? The first thing is they say, wow, and they say, que rico. And that's, uh, that's I think, a great description of a, of a uh, Sauvignon Blanc from Marlboro. So thank you so much, Jim, for, for your time. Uh, thank you for joining us, all these colleagues coming from Argentina. If you don't mind, I'm going to switch to Spanish to... Um, Say my farewell. Muchas gracias a todos por hey, participar. Hey, sorry, sí. sorry. Just one thing. If any of the members of the institute are sitting exams, or they need um, in-depth information on the New Zealand category, please do not hesitate to get in contact with me, and I'll I'll be able to provide whatever information people need for, for you know, sommelier exams or WACT exams or or um, whatever. Okay.
Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And I was saying that, of course, this presentation is also, it, it is available. We can share it with, uh, with the uh, Sommelier Association of Argentina. So uh, I think it has a lot of valuable information that, that you can pull from there. So, uh, and again, please come with us if you have any, any further questions. Ahora sí, pasa al español. Muchas gracias a la Asociación Argentina de Sommeliers por, uh, por uh, habernos invitado a participar. Muchas gracias, eh, Paz, Matías y todos los que están aquí presentes eh, por habernos invitado. Ha sido un placer realmente y sé que son pocas las oportunidades en las cuales para Argentina podemos hablar tanto sobre, sobre Nueva Zelanda, sobre Marlboro, sobre un, un destino que es tan lejano tal vez, pero que, que realmente tiene una gran importancia a nivel mundial, así que ha sido muy bueno, y poder contar con Jim, que realmente es una leyenda de la industria de Nueva Zelanda, porque tiene muchos años realmente trabajando para, para marcas de, de Nueva Zelanda, y también comunicando estos vinos en, en todo el mundo, ¿eh? que ha sido una, una gran parte en, la, en lo que es exportación, así que ha sido un placer contar con él. Thank you, Jim, again. Y bueno, lo dejo a ustedes, eh, Paz, Mati, para que, para que se despidan. Por mi parte, muchísimas gracias por habernos dejado participar. Bueno, eh, thank, you. Thank, you, thank you, Jim, again. We will, we will talk then with Federico eh, to, to, to see the possibility of all of us to, to go to New Zealand, but then we will talk with him. <laughs> with him. And especially a, a, a very pleasure about all the knowledge and all the information you share with us. We will share all the information with the, with the members of our association because it's a, it's a very clear and, and completely information. So thank you. Ah, y, y finalmente, ahora hablando en español, eh, como decía antes, eh, Federico es, 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 es uno de esos tantos sommeliers que argentinos que fueron de los inicios y hoy hace unos cuantos años está en Europa y creo que para, para todos los, los homilés de Argentina está bueno ver esas personas que tal vez muchos no conocieron o, o en mi caso tampoco conocimos en los inicios pero, pero que ponen al, a la homilés de Argentina y al vino eh, argentino muy, muy alto así que gracias Fede por, por haberte hecho el tiempo en la previa y, y hoy, así que Paz no Muchas sé gracias. si quieres sumar algo uh, just to say, uh, Jim, that uh, thank you very much for the clear explanations. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Fede, for all the work. Eh, gracias eh, a, a los dos. Eh, la verdad que es, es un lujo eh, poder ver clases como esta. Eh, y sobre todo, bueno, eh, Fede, eh, muy lindo verte y moderando también súper claro y, y trayendo luz a un un montón de temas, así que bueno, para mí es, es un placer haber podido presentar esta charla y, y presenciarla, gracias a todos porque las preguntas fueron buenísimas, eh, así que bueno, nos vemos en las próximas eh, masterclass y eh, cualquier cosa, eh, la, la presentación va a estar mandada a todos porque tiene un montón de texto interesantísimo. Así que muchas gracias a todos por, por estar. Gracias, Fede. Gracias, Kim. Eh, gracias. Mati, Moni. Gracias a todos. Gracias a todos. Nos vemos la próxima. Buenas tardes, noches, mañanas, según corresponda. Hasta luego. Thank you, muchas Jim. gracias. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.